Welcome to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast, where we explore the intersection between human mental health and our relationships with dogs. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, I'm Sharon. I am a human dog bond facilitator and therapeutic interaction strategist. I am the founder of Human Canine Collaborative, through which I support humans and dogs through trauma recovery, grief journeying, and professional practices of trauma-informed care by cultivating skills for somatic consent and nervous system regulation. I am also a licensed occupational therapist in California and hold a doctorate in occupational therapy with advanced clinical practice in community-based mental health. I have over 15 years experience working as a certified professional dog trainer and canine behavior consultant, specializing in public safety and dog bite prevention, animal assisted activities with special populations and rehabilitation for anxious, reactive and traumatized dogs. Hi, I'm Angela, the CEO of Cloud Doodles. We are a company that raises awareness about the benefits of dogs on mental health. We sell meaningful dog and human accessories to support our platform and to be able to give 25% of our profits to animal, dog, and mental health related charities. All of our patterns have a special mental health meaning and are designed and hand drawn by me. I believe that every human and dog should be privy to the unconditional love they provide for each other. I hold a BA in studio arts and a master's of social work. I am a licensed clinical social worker in the state of California, where I specialized in homelessness and severe mental illness. I currently reside in Italy with my poodle mix duchess, my husband, and toddler. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast. This is Sharon. And this is Angela. So I'm really excited because I am working on some written materials to support people in learning how to adjust activities and um, define their conditions for like helping the dog to say yes to activities and helping yourself to know like what, what kind of activity or what kind of conditions will I be able to say yes to that activity. So I'm working on a worksheet And it's going to come out in my newsletter um, over the next couple of weeks. So hop on my website, hc-collab.com, and sign up for my newsletter so that you can explore this concept with me of defining the conditions for your yes and helping your dog define their conditions for their yes. Wow, this sounds like a very cool uh, worksheet that you're working on, just helping humans and dogs with consent and understanding their own consent, um, as well as just continuing to strengthen the bond between human and canine. Very mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, hey, Angela, what updates do you have for Cloud Doodles? So updates for us, um, I, well, speaking of a newsletter, we have a monthly newsletter that I'm about to send out, um, but definitely sign up for that for next month. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about, uh, Valentine's Day, mostly because we do sell um, dog accessories and the fashion world is usually around these types of holidays uh, or inspired by. Um, So when I think about this holiday, I decided that I wanted to spread love and joy, um, but loving everybody around us, including ourselves, our dogs, strangers. I feel like we could use a little bit more of that in the world. Um, so we have a really fun challenge. It's a giveaway challenge on our Instagram. Um, if you go to our Instagram, uh, at cloud doodles, you will find it pinned to the grid and, um, it's all about affirmations and just spreading love and kindness. And there's an opportunity to win a harness set. So that's exciting. And we also still have our Valentine bundles, um, which are, uh, the promotion is valid through the 14th. Nice. That's it. (laughs) Cool. That sounds really fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so today we will start our conversation with a pre care tip as we always do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to let everybody know before we start doing that, that, uh, we are putting together a subscription, 
um, option where you will have access to all of our care tips and that should be coming up uh, very soon. So um, you'll be able to subscribe to Happy Dog, Happy Human podcasts and have all of these care tips at your fingertips to listen to over and over again as much as you want Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, and practice them. Yeah, Um, I'm so excited for that. It's going to be like a care tip library with mini uh, recordings of each of the care tips. So you can just like pick which one you want to do and then do it. Exactly. Um, And also in the future, we will be having additional conversations that uh, Sharon and I have on there. So um, we will be creating a really fun, exclusive um, uh, library for, um, for your pleasure. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so check it out we can't wait to launch it when it's ready exactly all right so for this week's care tip we are going to practice setting an intention mm-hmm. um this is something we can do for we can set an intention for our, our year our month our day and for our next hour mm-hmm. um so because we are having this conversation which is going to be on dog grief and again that can be a difficult conversation to have. So perhaps we can try to set our intention for this particular conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we will first do is close our eyes if we feel comfortable. Um, And by the way, with all these care tips, it's always okay to keep your eyes open or to have a squint, which is actually the, the usual way that monks meditate. They do keep their eyes open and on one lower point on the ground Mm -hmm. just so everybody knows because we've been doing a lot of these care tips with eyes closed but there are three options for that Mm -hmm. all right awesome yeah thanks for having that so I will close my eyes uh, because that's how I like to um, Mm -hmm. practice mindfulness cool (laughs) and we're going to take a deep breath to get in the moment into our bodies in through the nose out through the mouth. And now we're actually going to let our mind think about what we need in this moment to go forward into a conversation that can bring up feelings of vulnerability and sometimes discomfort due to that. And what is a word or a phrase that you can think about that can give you strength in these moments? Or maybe it's a word or a phrase that embodies a goal that we would like to get out of this conversation? And this word or phrase is something that we can think about throughout our conversation and beyond taking it with us throughout the rest of the day. I want you to imagine that word or phrase, the letters in your mind's eye, and watch it getting bigger and bigger and so big that it envelops you your whole body turning into a magical cloud that envelops you and that will carry you through the next hour, the next day, perhaps the next week. Let's take some deep breaths in this cloud, in through the nose out through the mouth and one more in through the nose out through the mouth and when you feel ready open your eyes Mm, I really like the visual images that you described of like the word surrounding you and lifting you. 
Yeah, I don't know if you've noticed, but I always, I'm a pretty visual person. So I, I often use those in my mindfulness practices. Um, and sometimes when I open my eyes, I don't know if you have that, but I did feel like I can kind of see this like haze around me, like the cloud, mm. um, which I always find interesting and mm -hmm. neat. Yeah, it was like the cloud was disappearing as my eyes were opening. Yeah, yeah. It's really, it's a nice feeling feeling warm and safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was really thinking about safety. And then I was realizing that I feel safe when I slow down. And so I found the intention, take a breath. Yeah. Oh, I like that. that. I like that a lot. Yeah. That's a great, great intention for grounding, especially when we feel, you know, discomfort, we may feel like we want to run yeah. <laughs> physically okay. even not just emotionally. Um, so that's a, that's a great intention. Mm -hmm. Mine was strength. So to be able to, um, find that within myself when I feel discomfort, or I feel like I can't find words to describe what I'm feeling or thinking. Um, so to have the strength to, or know that I have the strength to be able to do those things. Mm, yeah or even have the strength to not know exactly 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 yeah mm, awesome that's a hard one for me <laughs> yeah me too definitely yeah <laughs> very difficult I think for everybody it's hard mm -hmm. to not to not know but none yeah. of us actually know even all the so-called experts don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah exactly so I don't know <laughs> I don't know <laughs> that's how we're starting our conversation I don't yeah. know <laughs> but that's good we should carry that with us as an intention as well it's our communal intention mm -hmm. for this conversation yeah. we don't really know um, but we can still have conversations and reflect and um, share experiences and that's why I'm always so excited to talk with you uh, Sharon because you're always so open to having these conversations mm -hmm. yeah same I I really enjoy exploring these topics with you especially when we don't know yes exactly <laughs> um yeah. so do you want to so we're talking about the experience of well I guess a question we can just ask is do dogs experience grief yeah, that's a great question. And yeah. the answer is yes, they absolutely do experience grief. A lot of animals do, especially mm -hmm. animals that have evolved within complex social environments, um, like elephants and whales and wolves um, and like horses and cows even. So yeah, grief is really important. It's an important emotion because it, it helps us say goodbye. And I think it helps animals to say goodbye also. Um, and, and grief is not um, like the only other emotion that dogs can feel besides like happiness. We know they can feel happiness, but they can feel other complex emotions too, you know, like I've seen dogs who seem like they feel embarrassed and dogs can get frustrated or angry. They can of course get scared and there's like a variety of ways um, that they might feel scared and they can feel anxious or depressed uh, and they can also feel grief. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, want to take a second because we talked about grief last time as well and I didn't really think about that it's important to feel grief mm. um that we we need to to say goodbye uh to life transitions and it's the same for any animal mm -hmm. um I guess it's part of the cycle of life also mm -hmm. um and it makes me think about how the how elephants go back to the the burial grounds or the grounds where their family have died to pay their respects um that's in a way very important for them to do that they're able to do that which I think is incredible mm -hmm. um and also just shows like what a wide variety of emotions all beings feel 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that also makes me think of how I've heard about uh, how whales, um, orcas, even will, uh, if a calf dies, um, there are many examples of the mother staying with the body um, for a while. And I think about how like that just demonstrates the depth of the relationship between the mother and the calf and other um, other members of the family or the herd will also stay sometimes. And how like, there's um like you can't just like all of a sudden lose such an important family member and then go about your day you know what I yeah. mean like you yeah. need like the whales need to stay with the body as their their brains and bodies are coming into the realization about what has happened and how their lives are changed now you know like it's not it's not instantaneous it, there's a time period that's needed. And I think the grief allows the being to take the time. Yeah, I think that's that's very, um, well, it, it reminds me of a story of a dog um, and uh, a family of dogs. Um, so uh, a good friend of mine, her, she had two brothers and sister a brother and a sister pit mix and then a brother and a sister um like Maltese mm. and so there were four of them um and the sister of the pit mix uh passed away suddenly in 2021 and and I really love how she did this my friend decided to bring the body home of mm. the dog that passed mm. to um let everybody say goodbye to her and at first they were really not they were just a little like confused but then they ended up going up and sniffing her and um like it seemed like they really were saying goodbye in their own way mm -hmm. uh but the the blood brother so the other pit mix started screaming in a way that she had never experienced before this guttural mm -hmm. scream yeah. um which really to me just shows how connected they were not just by this pack that they created but by blood also mm. and that he was the most affected of all of them wow. um which goes to it ties into what we're talking about with the elephant and the calves yeah. um and of course she said that the screaming like continued for a long time yeah. uh and that things, you know, he still misses her, but with time and like routine, uh, keeping a, a routine, um, and also adopting a new female puppy that it has helped, um, both the, the brothers, the boy Maltese and the boy pit, um, kind of come alive again, which I think is really interesting also uh mm -hmm. that there was able to be an addition of a family member that was able to help them heal through it wow mm. oh what a beautiful story and such a sad story too I was like getting tears in my eyes as I thought about the the little boy pit um just uh mourning with yeah. uh with his voice you know and with his soul it was kind of like that that cry was coming from his soul and um it's so it's so sweet to know that dogs can love that deeply you know and it's also like really hard um I love that your friend thought to bring the body home I think that it can be so important for dogs to understand what happened mm. you know instead of to like not know what's happening especially if the humans are grieving too like to all of a sudden be like oh my gosh why is every why is this happening around right me? and I didn't actually that was the other piece was that the boy Maltese was more concerned about how she was feeling mm -hmm. than his own grief and I think like what you're saying makes so much sense that in a way at least the small the brother got to go through some of his own grieving and then also has like an understanding of what's going on with my friend yeah 
who of course was grieving as well. Yeah. Mm, yeah. That makes me think of uh, my dog, Gabby, who was a black lab and Gabby um, for the first part of her life, she was our only dog. And then we adopted a German shepherd named Zico. And I never thought that Gabby loved Zico because at first she really was not <laughs> happy about him. <laughs> like he would take up a lot of space and he always tried to play with her but he used his mouth too much and uh he would go on the furniture and she didn't like that because she wanted to be on the furniture <laughs> so I was always like Ooh, I, I would question like the decision of bringing him home um but over the years they developed a beautiful relationship and learned how to play together um, and Zico would even like give up his bones when Gabby would come over and steal them. <laughs> and he would like give her a little kiss as she took the bone away. <laughs> and then he died suddenly. Um, like in, in the morning, he was fine. And then he went downhill and had internal bleeding and we didn't know what was happening. Um, and then we had to rush him over to the vet and we ended up having to euthanize him that night because they thought he had hemangiosarcoma, which is a very aggressive cancer that causes internal bleeding. So um, before we had taken him to the vet, um, Gabby was with him at home. And so I'm sure that she was watching something happen to him and perhaps there could have been um, a scent change, there was a demeanor change in him. So like she had that exposure to understand something was not right. And then he didn't come home that night. And then um, my partner, Tom and I were grieving quite a bit. And I remember a couple of days later, I was in our living room and Gabby walked out from the bedroom and she looked over to where Zico's bed was. And then she just hung her head and like, um, just like tiptoed, like walked exaggeratedly slow past the bed. And she did that twice. Um, and I was like, wow, like I didn't expect her to have so much grief for him. And I remember you mentioned that uh, your friend maintained the dog's daily routine as part of trying to help them. And that was one of the things we did with Gabby. Like we would still, um, go for walks and we would even walk to the places where we had walked with Zico or like go to the beach that we went you know with Zico to so that we could just like all remember him but also still feel like um, like we can still go through our day yeah that's really beautiful and it's also it, it sounds like it was a way for Gabby to like commemorate him also to be where he was yeah. um but yeah, I mean, they, it's just, it's amazing. The story is also, of course, amazing. And I don't know, like, I don't think why I would expect any different of like her reaction, um, yeah, yeah. you know, because of course that makes sense. It's this sibling basically that, you know, she had and, and they're gone. Like the, it only makes sense that, you know, animals also experience the grief the way that we do and go through the a lot of those different emotions of like remembering in a good way like I'm sorry that's that was I said that wrong but like having no, like, you know, remember like in a good way, even well remembering in a good way yeah sure and then feeling like the deep sadness um as well and like I think that story just highlights this sort of waves that that uh, a dog also goes through um mm -hmm. that it's not just a human experience uh, that we feel grief. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there can be a lot of chaos. Like we had talked about that with human grief. There's this disoriented feeling and like out of control or like chaotic or, uh, like wanting to, wanting to have a structure or an understanding of what's happening. Right. That yeah. human experience. And I can only imagine that, uh, that the dog would experience a similar disorientation or chaos or uh, need for structure. Yeah. And I think that really resonates with me when I hear the story about um, my friend's pet, that this was a blood sibling and his entire identity was always wrapped with his sisters and to have her be gone. Mm -hmm. um it's like what what like the way she makes it 
seem is that he's kind of wondering what he's supposed to be doing with himself. Yeah. Um, without his sister Mm -hmm. and, uh, maybe having this, you know, she was left with the two boys because also the, the female Maltese, um, passed in the same year. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was very difficult for the whole family to adjust to that. And I, and her desire to bring in a new, uh, female Maltese, I think was to kind of bring that dynamic back to help bring that dynamic back and have, and for her too, and to have this youthfulness in the house. And, Mm -hmm. and uh, when she was ready, she did a, you know, she took a lot of time before adopting the new one. Um, Mm -hmm. But, uh, and at first, like you were saying, it was hard, of course, they weren't so thrilled, but over time, it seems like it's really helped um, um, bring a new dynamic, of course, because you can, it can never be this, the same, but it can, um, um, also uh it can also help mend i guess the the feeling of loss Mm -hmm. yeah i think when there's another dog who hasn't experienced the loss then and they're young too um they provide a lot of distraction from the experience and then they bring in a lot of opportunities to play you know because i think um the ones who are grieving might not feel as playful, especially oh. if, if the dog who passed away was a, a playmate. Um, so yeah, so the young one brings back that that energy to play and to move, and uh, which can be just really helpful for coping with yeah. the, with the aspects of grief. Yeah, absolutely, that makes sense. And these two dogs, of course, are older now. The two boys, so I, I think that helps in in general. Um, just. <laughs> liven the old ones up again a bit yeah yeah the seniors. I like hearing <laughs> yeah those sweet seniors yes. I like hearing that your friend took to us a good amount of time before bringing the new dog in um and I know everybody does this differently some people um feel really overwhelmed and bring in a new dog right away and I don't think there's like I don't want to say any any way you do it is wrong you know but I think it's And I think it's also important to recognize that dogs, I think of um, the human and dog relationship as like a parent and child relationship, not that dogs are like human children, but in terms of the responsibilities that we have for them and in recognizing um, the limitations in what we should be asking of dogs. So for example, like if we are grieving a lot about the loss of our, a dog and we have another dog who is also grieving, um, as the parent, we need to take care of ourselves and our own grief so that we can support our companion through their grief. And we also if we're bringing another dog in specifically to help everybody with the grief, it's, we want to be careful about how much responsibility we're placing on that new dog for caring for our grief. You know, that would be like bringing in a child um, to be the therapist (laughs) for the family. And, um, and that's not appropriate. You know, dogs really, they need support from us and certainly they can give it back, but we need to be mindful about how much we're asking and make sure we're taking care of ourselves so that our dogs can receive um, the care that they need and the structure and the leadership that's that they need from us. Absolutely. I mean, and I also think about how, um, you know, we need to care for this new being. And if we're bringing them in for that particular reason, one, you may end up resenting them and the other dog in your house may resent them. And also, you know, we want to adopt a dog because we're fully ready to, you know, take on the responsibility and uh, give them our full love also um, Mm -hmm. without there sort of maybe being something hanging over that, that, um, you know, that you miss the other, the the dog that you're sort of replacing the old dog with. Mm. actually I have an interesting story about that because I think I mentioned this last time that Duchess came into my life when Princess died That's right. and that was not on purpose right mm. wow. so Princess I think as I said in the last time I think Princess sort of let let herself go because she knew that I was um, 
going to be okay with Duchess. Yeah. But so I, I was able to sort of, I don't feel any resentment towards Duchess in that way at all, because the, it, that was, you know, that's sort of how I've come to terms with it, I think, by thinking that. Mm-hmm. But um, for the first two years, Duchess was living with, I was living with my parents and Duchess was living with them too. And my dad actually resented Duchess a lot Mm -hmm. um, because he loved Princess and that was really his dog. And he was not, it took him a long time to sort of accept Duchess um, because it was too soon for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Mm, that makes so much sense. I learned something about resentment over this past year um, and it has to do with consent. So I learned about uh, service as a like service to like doing something for the benefit of somebody else. And when we are giving beyond our capacity or like serving or doing something for someone else, but we really don't want to, that's when resentment comes up. So it's like a really great cue or a sign to know like, oh, I'm giving beyond my boundary. I'm crossing my own boundary for what I'm able to give. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, And it also makes me think like in this particular situation, I never, it was a bit strange because I was an adult, but I never asked my dad if it was okay. I sort of just said, this dog is going to live with us now. And uh you know, I moved out and took her with me, yeah. but he, he definitely, I mean, they like each other, but it took him a while to warm up to her. Um, especially actually, which is interesting because their personalities are so different. Mm-hmm. Princess and Duchess, they they could not be more different. So. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really big, uh, thing to pay attention to is like, what am I expecting from this new dog? Am, am I expecting them to replace the other one um, or to be like the other one? You know, especially if it's like a relative, maybe you went back to the same breeder and got a relative of the dog who you lost and you're expecting, you know, a certain personality or behavior or, or ease in caring for them. And then you don't have that because you have a completely different being with different needs, a different age, different personality um and and you might not be ready for that yeah exactly exactly um and in a way we have to like I mean we never let go of the ones we lose but they're but we also have to let go (laughs) a part of us has to let go or make room is a better way of saying it in our hearts to bring in Mm -hmm. somebody new or a new being um so yeah so that's that I definitely can see how that can happen I mean and it did it didn't happen for me but I think my relationship with Duchess is also just different Mm -hmm. um but that's so interesting what you were saying about resentment I actually learned something about resentment this year too (laughs) (laughs) which is it's better to feel guilty than resentful Ooh, interesting So yeah, it's like guilt is like, oh, I did something wrong. And resentment is almost like you feel like somebody's taking something from you. Right. And so you can work through the guilt because usually human beings tend to feel guilt that is not really accurate, I would say. I would use that word like it's more, um, like it's about like we shame ourselves and we don't need exactly to, we need to love ourselves better exactly like feeling guilty in an accurate way would be if you really do something horrific to someone then you should feel guilty so if you kill someone I would hope you feel guilty yeah. right yeah. <laughs> but a lot of times <laughs> right so that it's an appropriate feeling but a lot of times you know, connecting to what you're saying, we feel guilt because let's say somebody asked us to do something and we feel guilty, like we have to do it because Mm -hmm. if we don't do it, they'll hate us or blah, 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 whatever that is, Mm -hmm. whatever that narrative is. Um, So instead what I learned that it's better to feel that feeling and work through that than to do the thing and then feel resentful. 
Ooh, right. Yeah. So like you're feeling obligated or like you should do something or you kind of mentioned like if I don't do it they might get upset or they might judge me or they might think I'm weird and if you can notice that's coming up before you say yes then you might be able to go like oh why am I trying to force myself or why am I imagining that they're going to get upset or why do I care what they think of me if I'm you know as long as I'm taking care of myself yeah, exactly. And I wonder, also, I was just, it made me start thinking, like, do you think dogs feel resentment? So if we, Ooh. let's take our example with the pit, like, do you think if that Maltese came in too early, the new, the new girl Maltese, um, if she came in too early, could the pit resent her? Mm, interesting. That's a good question. I guess it would be if the dog was giving beyond their means but I, I almost feel like dogs don't dogs are not as likely to cross their own boundaries as humans are so if a dog was giving beyond their means it's because the human is taking from the dog not because the dog is giving that makes a lot of sense but that's something that we can end up doing to animals. Actually, you know what this made me, okay, now I'm, this is a good conversation though. I'm loving this. You know what this made me think about? Have you seen, um, we're going to talk about orcas again. <laughs> I love them. Orcas are awesome. Um, for those of you who don't know, their brain, they actually have a part of their brain that we don't have that's dedicated to social everything. Wow. So social interactions. Um, it's super, super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they're like the probably some of the most social creatures in the world, more than us. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but um, what I was going to talk about uh, was black. Did you see blackfish? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, oh, it's yeah. a very good move. It's a very good documentary, but you know, trigger warning: you will be crying the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Such an important film such an important film about the orca industry and dolphin um in general yeah. like the sea world type mm -hmm. uh, parks captive, captive shows yeah captive shows exactly um and taking orcas away from their pods mm -hmm. uh, which is what we were just talking about that they're extremely social animals yeah. and there have been several accidents where orcas well, I don't think they're accidents on the orcas part, but there have been several accidents where orcas have actually dragged trainers down yeah. um, and drowned them. Yeah. Wow. And I wonder if in part that is because we're asking too much of them. Ooh, also. Like they, yeah. Like they got angry. They got angry. They got resentful. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, to me, that shows that there is a capacity for feeling that. Mm -hmm. that of, of you're asking too much of me and I, I'm going to act out in response to that yeah you're not listening to me you're not respecting my boundary exactly mm -hmm. exactly um so I'm sure dogs a lot of times like that's also something that we have the capacity to do to them too Ooh, um yeah. yeah I'm thinking about like when people say my dog bit out of the blue yeah like, there's no warning and I really don't believe that I believe there is always a warning um, I don't think dogs are unpredictable I think humans have a hard time predicting and right. missing the signs and so like let's say a dog um, doesn't like when the human goes and tries to cuddle with them when they're sleeping on the couch for example right and then maybe the dog at first just kind of like sniffins and groans and then this keeps happening and then it develops into like now the dog growls when I go and try to cuddle with them and then the dog growls when they're just the humans just approaching you know like and then eventually the dog bites but maybe there was no growl before the bite you know the human just approaches and the dog bites mm. and there and it seems like there was no warning but it's like well what about the months before that when the dog was growling you know, the dog did give a warning. They were setting a boundary and we just weren't listening to it or respecting it. And then the dog learned, well, I guess there's no point in growling because you're not listening. So I'm going to have to increase the intensity here and bite you because you're, you're not listening. You're not getting it. Yeah. That makes, 
tons of sense to me. Um, and I think actually like bringing this back to the grief experience that we know, you know, our dogs can't tell us in words what that might, that experience might be like, but we know for humans, how chaotic it can feel for us and the time and space that we need, Mm -hmm. um, to go through it and even have somebody else see us in that grief. And I think dogs need the same thing. Mm, Yeah. They need time and to be seen and affirmed. Yeah, exactly. They're feeling. And the one thing we haven't talked about also is uh, when humans die and dogs are present um, Mm -hmm. and the grief they might experience, you know, we hear, there's so many different stories that you hear about um, dogs doing some things that are just, you know, incredible into showing their, again, their emotional like landscape and how the depth of it. Yeah, um, I was looking up some of these stories. Oh, please tell. <laughs> there are stories from all over the world, um, from across time. And it's really interesting. I was looking them up to kind of understand the details. And um, I'm going to tell you about some of them if you'd like to hear. Please, I'm very curious. I would love to hear. Yeah. So there are two types of stories. One type is where the dog remains by the human's grave or visits the grave uh, for years after the human has died. And I found two stories about this, one from 1855 or between 1855 and 1872, a terrier named Gray Friars Bobby uh, visited his human's grave in Scotland for 14 years, every day for 14 years after the human died. And wow. this was really interesting because the dog didn't um, see the person die and didn't like go to the funeral or the burial, but was able to find the grave and then spent every day at the, cer- the cemetery after that for 14 years. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, the, and another one was um, more recent to in between 2006 and 2018, a shepherd named Capitan in Argentina visited his owner's grave for 12 years, every day for 12 years after the human died. That reminds me of the elephants a little bit too. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the other category is when the dog continues to go to some kind of like some kind of meeting place where they used mm-hmm. to meet the human. So in 1923, this is one of the most famous stories, 1923 to 1935, this Akita named Hachiko in Japan would go, um, when the human was alive, the dog Hachiko would go to the train station and meet the human after work. And then the human died at work and didn't come home on the train that day. And then every day for nine years, Hachiko would go back to the train station to wait for the human. And then uh, there's a similar story uh, in 1936 in the U.S. in Montana, a sheepdog named Shep, um, who was actually named by the people at the train station, um, would go to the train station every day for five and a half years. And Shep actually saw the human's casket loaded onto a train and then the train left. And so then Shep would go back to the train station every day to wait And then there's one from Italy, a dog named Fido. And did you know Fido means loyalty in Latin? No, I didn't. I learned that looking up this story. And this was in the 40s, 1940s, uh, one to 1958. Fido uh, would go to the bus stop where he would meet his human after work every day for 14 years. Wow, that's just one, it kind of, I mean, I'm in awe that this that they're that they do again I don't know why I'm in awe like it makes sense yeah Um, if all the animals that would do that of course a dog would yeah but also the waiting breaks my heart a little bit to hear that they're waiting um Mm -hmm. but it's interesting because also taking it back though if we want to reframe that they're also it's becomes their routine yeah and we talked about how that is healing and grief and that routine may be healing for them Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the people, all these stories like were passed around because people 
saw the dog at the train station or the bus station or the cemetery. And then the humans who were watching this, they would start to feed the dog and care for the dog. And even um, Greyfriars Bobby got like a collar and some of the dogs were named by these people. So it almost became like a new, like a way of like moving on with their human who, who died, but like meeting these new humans and having this new routine. Yeah you know in a new community yeah mm -hmm. that's really beautiful yeah it's a it's a beautiful way to commemorate life how they commemorate life and then also interact with other life yeah yeah and I was thinking about like what I was wondering like what is the motivation like when the dog is visiting the grave that seems a little bit more clear right like yeah. that's like grief and wanting to stay connected mm -hmm. um, and mourn but when the dog continues to go to the train station or the bus stop and maybe they didn't see their human die or they don't know that they've died is that denial are they in the denial oh that's so you know, interesting I was hoping grief. it's like the other one that was how I was thinking but right. maybe it's optimism like or like routine like you said but like optimism that like okay they're going to come back today it wasn't yesterday. Oh, it wasn't yeah. all those other yeah. weeks, but it's going to be today. Maybe. We don't know. We can't get inside their head. I know. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable, though. It's amazing to see. Well, I have something. I have a similar one, and I don't know what category it would fall under. Story mm -hmm. of my uncle who um, was very sick, and his dog, he had a Dalmatian. Mm -hmm. I forgot his name but he was also very sick and old and my uncle didn't want to um, uh, euthanize him. Mm -hmm. And then my uncle died and mm -hmm. this, the Dalmatian would just stay in his bed all day. He couldn't walk. Like he actually couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. And the day that my uncle died, they found the Dalmatian upstairs in his bed. Wow. And so it, he knew and it's kind of ties in maybe to the second piece that he knew my uncle had died, even though my uncle was in the hospital. Mm, yeah. So maybe they do, you, you know, dogs have a sixth sense. Maybe they know. Well, they, we, first of all, we all have at least six senses. Oh, what's our think, sixth one? Well, we have the five, you know, regular senses. Yeah, the that five, like knows. typical. Yeah. And then we have three move like body senses, like um, like our sense of balance. For mm. example, we know like whether we're upside down or right side up, or whether we're spinning around or sitting still. <laughs> and then we have a You're sense right. of movement, like we know where our arms are. If someone puts your arm in a certain position, you know what it is without looking. Oh wow! Right. And then yeah. we have a sense of pressure. Like we can tell if something is squeezing us or if the air pressure is different. Yes, absolutely. Like when it's 104 degrees out here in the summer, yeah. I feel the pressure. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay, I had never thought about that. And then we have all these senses um, about what's happening inside our body. Like we have a sense of hunger, a sense of thirst, a sense of pain, a sense of itchiness, a sense of time and more you know I'm I'm smiling because I those senses to me are also so connected psychologically yes. to what's going on yes. in your head right um I know the outer ones are too of course but all of those there's just this like huge psychological component to it mm -hmm. yeah like it's like the sensation comes up in your body and then your brain tries to explain it to you like oh yeah. you're feeling this because of that but the, the, yeah. it's not always the right story I think that's no right. or like the anticipation of like pain for example you know a lot of times pain I learned this in my birthing classes <laughs> mm, cool. but it's true yeah a lot of times pain is is it's we we think it's something that it's not yeah. um or yeah. we put words to it that isn't accurate mm. so one of the first things I had to do in my birthing class which was mindful birthing was uh okay we had to learn about what labor pain actually is it's not like a stabbing feeling uh -huh. but we may think that but there is no stabbing and there's actually not that much not that many ways to describe that sense but we get overwhelmed by the idea of it Wow. So it was learning, you know, how to just 
accurately represent like what it is the sensations that you're experiencing oh that sounds really helpful it was very helpful to like I have highly- words yeah, yeah. <laughs> to describe this is what's happening and to know what to expect yeah exactly exactly mm-hmm. yeah but we were talking about dogs having a sixth sense or like a knowing yes. that something happens and I think we all can access that um because like, let's imagine like what happened to your uncle's dog, right? So at first the uncle was at home and then at some point he went to the hospital and there must be, have been some sort of physical decline, right? Yeah. But the dog was watching and noticing or smelling, hearing, yeah. seeing. Absolutely. Maybe there were other people involved, like people were coming over to check or to help, you know? Um, and seeing like, oh, this other person is taking me for a walk now, not my regular human, you know, and just like they see the decline. And then if the death, when the death happens, there are, are, again, other people are coming to take care of the dog and the human's no longer there. And I think dogs can like, they can smell physical decline. They can smell death. Um, You know, they can smell grief. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that makes so much that makes so much sense. I mean, again, it's, it's animals and dogs, they have an awareness that we don't give them credit for. Yeah. And that we don't give ourselves credit for either. You're right. And I was going to say what our sixth sense is then it's really intuition or that listening to your gut. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, when you get that feeling like, like something just feels wrong. Mm-hmm. something wrong is about to happen yeah and a lot of times we don't listen to that um but it's usually on point right yeah yeah like that like we don't listen to it because we're going I should do this anyways even though I don't want to right and well yeah we have to... all these cultural things telling us not to listen to it yeah yeah well, this was a very interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed exploring the different emotions that dogs can feel and hearing the stories about different uh, experiences and ways the dogs have processed grief and behaved after a death. Yeah, I find it really interesting to compare, um, you know, how our conversations go about human experience, because that's something people verbally are telling us or we can tell because it's our experience with language and so I find it really interesting when we talk about when we do these dog episodes um, because it's a lot of storytelling and a lot of I don't know Um, and so I really appreciate the the directions these these go in and we still have an I don't know kind of at the end of this but that's a good thing right we can ponder about this some more Mm -hmm. um Yeah. Yeah. It's always good to have questions and curiosity. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. Mm, So I'm going to take us through our aftercare tip, and this is one for both you and your dog. So we talked about um, the importance of like maintaining a daily routine with a dog and validating their feelings when they're grieving. And it's also important to, I think, sometimes do new activities with a dog that you couldn't have done before, maybe with the other one, Um, you know, like something that is for you and your dog, um, the one that remains with you. And we also talked about the sense of pressure being an additional sense that we have. So this is going to be a, an exercise in which you can teach your dog to lay their head in your lap to give you some deep pressure. And this becomes an activity that you can do with your dog that helps you bond with each other and um, just be together. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to move over to my cozy corner over here to demonstrate with my... I wonder if Duchess will come join me. Let's see. Okay, we'll go get some treats. If you're listening along and you're going to do this with your dog right now, go and get some treats and then find a comfortable place to sit. Duchy. Duchess was uh, here, so she seemed like she wanted to come by. Okay, great. Hi, Duchess. 
So you're just gonna have a comfortable place to sit. And I always like to do this with my back against something because then I can relax mm -hmm. a bit. And when I'm leaning back, I can also make space for my dog to come and join me. And you might do this on a couch if your dog is allowed on the couch. Um, sometimes you might want to lay a blanket or a towel down to give a physical cue to your dog that they're allowed on the couch with you. Um, or you might do this on the floor. If your dog is not allowed on the couch or can't get on the couch, you can just lay a towel or a blanket down um, or be next to your dog's bed and just sit there. And so what you want to do is you want to teach your dog to lay their head in your lap. And so this is my little sidekick over here who's going to help us. So you want to get some sort of treat that your dog likes, but it doesn't have to be super high value because we don't have a lot of distractions here. And at first, all you're going to do is take the treat, put it on your lap, and then let the dog eat it off your lap. And you might point to it or tap it if they're not sure where it is. You could let them smell it and then put it on your lap. Um, and if they're really not eating it, they might not be hungry or you might need a different treat. <laughs> Duchess is not quite sure. Duchess is. Put it in my mouth. <laughs> and, if, and if that's what your dog needs to get started, that's fine. You can just let them get the treat just for hanging out with you. And it might take a couple of sessions before they uh, realize that it's a relaxing time or that they should put their head in your lap. Um, especially if your dog is remaining in a sit, like you want to see that the dog is laying down and getting comfortable and they might not understand at first that this is what's happening because maybe you've never done it. So you might just breathe quietly and just hang out with your dog and periodically give them a treat, even if they're just sitting next to you. But if you keep putting the treat on your lap for the dog to take it from there, Pretty soon the dog is going to realize that um, they might be more comfortable if they lay down because they'll be closer to the treat or they might be more comfortable if they go to the other side of the couch, <laughs> which is totally fine too. Thanks Duchess for letting us know. And um, you can still put the treat on your lap and let your dog come back and get it and then they can leave again. That's totally fine. Or sometimes I will even toss the treat away and then the dog gets to choose to come back and do the activity. Yeah, nice. Nice. So like the most important part of this activity is that you and your dog are relaxing together and enjoying being together. And eventually, um, because you're putting the treat on your lap for your dog to eat, your dog is going to realize that's where the treats are coming from. So I'm going to stay close to that spot. And eventually, you want to see that your dog puts their head in your lap. And that's when you give them a treat. So you'll, they'll put your head, their head in your lap, you give them a treat, and then maybe they'll sit up and chew it, yum, yum, yum. And then they'll put their head down again to say, I want another treat. And then you give them another one. And then once you get to that point, then they realize, oh, I'm getting the treat because I put my head in your lap. And I've noticed that uh, if the dog has a touch sensitivity, like if your dog isn't a cuddler or they don't like to be touched certain times, this activity is a little bit harder for them because they might not like to relax while they're touching somebody. And that's okay too. So sometimes what I'll do to make it easier is I'll put a like folded up towel in my lap and the dog can put their head on that. I also find that helpful for dogs that drool. So if your dog drools and that's like gross for you on your pants, put a towel down and your dog can put their head on the towel. And then sometimes that, the feeling of the towel feels better than the feeling of your lap because your lap is warm uh, or maybe they don't like the fabric of your or the texture of your pants or whatever. So a towel can be helpful. Yeah, and that's the activity and you can do it like for a couple of minutes. Um, or until you both fall asleep, whatever feels the most relaxing. That was really fun. <laughs> Duchess did not cooperate, but um, I think it was because I got her like a little chew, a piece of a chew that was left. So she was more interested in chewing it. Mm -hmm. Although that's not a high value treat for her. So mm -hmm. yeah. 
I don't, I, she just didn't. But also I wonder, cause she's little, like maybe she, with the little dogs, just having them sit on your lap. Would yeah. have a similar effect. Cause that's exactly. more her. I don't think the head, she's not a little less interested in it. So would that be okay too? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. However your dog wants to do it is fine. It's kind of like about figuring out what's the best way to do it for both of you. Definitely. And I also was thinking, cause something she loves to do is to like lay vertically on my chest and that's great for the, for pressure. Cause then it's also on my chest. Mm -hmm. So I know it kind of varies also with dog size, of course, cause if your big dog is, uh, suffocating you that might not be so nice <laughs> right <laughs> yeah definitely take the size of your dog and your dog's sensory preferences and treat preferences into account yeah because I if I got her a high value treat that would not work she would be like barking at me for it yeah Gabby was the same way yeah too yeah. exciting yeah too excited too excited mm -hmm. And maybe I should stop using treats for modeling pictures because whenever I bring them out, now she just sits and tries to model for me. Oh, yes. Like, oh, I know what that means. Yeah, exactly. She's like, oh, I have to sit and I look like this. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you, you use a different treat. Like there's a certain treat for modeling and another treat for deep pressure. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I also love one time you gave this as an idea to hold a chew also that maybe that mm -hmm. that be a good time um, to hold a chew and have them put their head on your lap at the same time. Yeah, totally. I would say just like with the chew, make sure it's something um, that's big enough for your hand to be there and your dog to chew the other end. So we don't want your fingers to get bit by accident. Right, right, right. Chewing. I really like to use um, those toys that are like a rubber toy. The company Westpaw makes a really good one. It looks kind of like a dumbbell, but it has holes in it. So you could stick a bully stick into it. Mm. And so then you can hold the toy and the dog chews the bully stick. Oh, that's great. That's really great advice. All yeah. Right. I'll put a link to the Westpaw uh, toy in the footnotes. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, this was great. I really appreciate learning to do um, more relaxing things with the duchess or you know just different ways of relaxing together yeah yeah I think that's so helpful for both yeah. of your nervous systems absolutely mm -hmm. all right well um great conversation as always I Thank always you. love uh talking to you Sharon and um our next episode will be on a whole new topic mm -hmm. yeah I'm excited to explore what it is but exactly. it'll be a surprise. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angela. I really enjoyed this. All right. Bye, Sharon. Bye. Even though we are licensed professionals in our own field of work, Angela, LCSW, Sharon, OTD, and CDBC, this podcast is not intended to replace individual therapy for humans or behavior support for dogs. We approach our conversations from an exploratory, observational, and strictly personal lens. If you are struggling with your mental health, your dog's behavior, or if you or your dog have experienced a recent traumatic event, please see the resources section on our websites for a list of resources and places that can help. Visit either www.hc-collab.com slash happy dog, happy human, or www.clouddoodles.com slash happy dog, happy human. For additional show notes, including books and articles that we mentioned, please check out the footnotes section on our websites. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support the show, Go to buymeacoffee.com slash HDHH podcast and send us a few bucks so that we can stay awake and energized to make more content. This podcast is made possible by the collaboration between Cloud Doodles and Human Canine Collaborative. Check out our websites at www.clouddoodles.com or www.hc-collab.com. Special thanks to Tom Fox at Tom Fox Photos for support with editing and production consulting. You can find Tom at tomfoxphotos.com. 
Also, special, special thanks to sound effects and story examples from Duchess and Muggins. We could not and would not ever want to do this without you.